Um, we will definitely be praying for them. Um, another thing that I want to uh, talk about today, and again, it's something we talked about a little bit a while back. Um, it was an article written. Um, it was an article written. I want to say in, oh, I can't remember what the what the it was a right wing a right wing social media platform, but it was about Bluey. We talked a little bit about it. Um, I thought I'd, I wanted to readdress it because something else came up that I that I thought I'd share with you. And what it was was, um, so that's Bluey, and that's Bluey's dad. And I'm pointing at it here. You can't see that. Sorry, but that's Bluey. That's Bluey's family. His dad is is the big uh, the blue big blue dog behind him. Uh, it's an Australian show for kids cartoon, and it's really lovely. It's really quite charming and. And just is g- genuinely lovely. It's fun. Like I, when my my kids will watch it from time to time, and it's not a show that's really on their radar. But when my kids will watch it from time to time, just sort of as a as a joke, it's actually like we all laugh. And it is. It's meant for little kids. But my older kids and I, we laugh at it. It's it's hilarious. Anyhow, there was an article written about Bluey's dad that uh, the, the the show depicts him as being. Well, not a very Christian dad. Um, he's he's way too engaged. He's way too present. He's way too involved. He's way too, I guess, nice and loving and and lovely. That he's just you know, and it's that's not how dads are supposed to be. And then the guy goes on to a thing about how dads are supposed to be. Now, the author, God love him, the author of the article. He does say that, you know, probably less than 1% one pe- 1% of people will agree with me. And I, I think he's wrong. I think it's far fewer than that. But <clears throat> yeah. So I w- I've been thinking about it. Like, you know, what's what's the argument against this? Well, there's no argument against this. The article's just genuinely ridiculous. It's just absolutely not something that is true. There's no way we can be too present to our kids. Now, I've seen, as a coach, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen what they call helicopter parents, right? Parents who are always sort of hovering around. I've seen helicopter parents, and I've had to learn how to how to work with that. And I've seen what we now call snowplow parents, which are our parents who, um, well, they they make sure that their kid never faces any obstacle um, that would that would get in their way, and they do quite a lot of harm to their child by clearing the way in, in the fashions that they do because kids need to be challenged and they need to they need to fail to be honest with you um so uh, you know that's but that wasn't this guy's argument that that well this guy's argument was not um we're 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 helicopter parents and we're causing our kids emotional pain by never giving them any space. His argument was, this isn't how God intended it to be. So it's a ridiculous statement. I wasn't going to get into that. But I've been thinking about it. Well, why write something like this? Why does a person write something like this? And then I looked at, I looked at uh, some other right-wing social media, some other right-wing media platforms. And I thought, well, why do they write any of this stuff? And then, and then we were talking, I was talking in the congregation here, here at St. Margaret's, we were talking about, we were talking about ministers who, who will, um, who will give sermons about things that have no impact on their congregation, right? So uh, for example, a church that, um, a church that is not LGBTQ uh, plus affirming, uh, will give sermons about the the evils and the dangers of being gay. Now, everybody in that congregation knows that they're not an affirming church, so you're talking to a congregation filled of people, filled with people who who aren't affirming. Well, why would you go and and give that sermon? Because ultimately, what you end up doing is you end up pointing at others, right? You end up you end up you're not preaching to your congregation, you're preaching against people who aren't in your congregation. You're causing division. And ultimately, I think division sells, right? Division sells. Now, I found this really interesting uh, tweet. Are we still calling them tweets on Twitter, on X? Anyway, I found this really interesting tweet, and it's um, written by Benjamin Kramer. If, if, If you get a chance to check him out, he's really quite brilliant. 
He says, beware of any Christian movement that acts as though the world is full of enemies to be destroyed rather than neighbors to be loved. And that's what I want to talk about. The whole reason that Bluey article was written about the evils and the dangers of Bluey's dad being too present is because it was trying to generate fear, right? It was trying to show, the author was trying to tell us that we should be afraid of this guy. And and we should stand against this kind of material and this kind of content. This kind of content, this kind of material, this kind of message is indeed an enemy. That we should be, an enemy that we should be really, really angry with. An angry we should, an enemy that we should be, uh, we should be outraged about. Right? It's about manufacturing anger and outrage in us directed at someone else. But that's not the Christian way. Like we're not supposed to be in a continuous state of outrage. We're not supposed to be in a continuous state where we're, we're looking all around for the next vile predator who's lurking, who's going to teach our kids about, about a father being present. Oh, we got to be careful of those ones. Or teach our kids about, you know, our young men about how to bake cookies or something like that. Like, we're, we're continuing, we have these people, like the author of that article, who are manu- who, whose job it is, is to manufacture outrage in their readers. They want to keep their readers in a perpetual state of of agitation and irritation and frustration, anger, and ultimately lead them. What they're doing is they're preaching about someone who isn't there, creating an enemy to be hated, creating an enemy to be vilified, creating an enemy to to be scorned. Because it sells. It sells clicks. It sells views. It, it gets you noticed. It gets you on, on TV. It gets you on podcasts. It gets you interviewed. Right? You become a, you become a banner. A bannerman for, for righteous indignation. It steals from the world is what it does. It steals our time. It steals our energy. It steals our, it steals the reputation of our neighbors from us. It it, it steals our understanding of who our neighbor is. It steals the possibility. It's a theft in that it steals the possibility that we can build even stronger more nourish, nourishing, long-lasting, spiritually uplifting relationships with people who are different than us. It's a thief. In, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, in, in the name of God, in the name of the church, in the name of Christianity, in the name of, of the religion, they're trying to steal our peace and they're trying to steal our calm, and they're trying to steal the possibility of us relating to the people around us, which actually robs us of the potential opportunities to share the gospel, to show our neighbors the true love of Jesus Christ. These guys it's not just this bluey author. There's a million of them out there. Go on Twitter for five minutes and you'll bump into 16 of them. Wouldn't even take five minutes. They're just manufacturing angst. They want to keep anybody who, who, who sees the world in their way, they want to convince you that there's an enemy to worry about. They want to convince you that there's, there's an enemy to fight. They want to keep us filled with hate. In the name of Jesus Christ, they want to keep us filled with righteous indignation. And all they're doing, all they're doing is they're stealing our hope and our joy. Stealing our peace and ultimately our capacity to love. 
there's always, there is always the opportunity for us to do the same. I know being a content creator in, in the way that I do it here with all of you, it's always something that is so easy for me to do. And I suspect there are times when I cross that line and I do it. And I apologize to you when I do it. I apologize to you now. I am sorry for when I've crossed that line. Because uh, again, I said it last week, I don't want to become what I despise. I don't want to become a broker of fear. I don't want to become a broker of anger. I don't want to become... Uh, 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 someone who, who, who robs you of the opportunity and your capacity to love another. <laughs> Hate and anger are so easy. So easy. It's so easy. <laughs> like they're so, it's, I don't know if I can say this too many times, but I'll say it one more time. Hate and anger and, and reacting with hate and anger is just so easy. But when we react with love and we react with patience and we react with kindness and gentleness and mercy, when we react with, when we, when we react with the characteristics of Jesus Christ, it's, it is more difficult without question. It's more difficult. We might not get a million people lining up behind us with pitchforks and torches but what we will create is life. It's life-giving. This is life-giving stuff. Anger and hate, it steals life. Love, mercy, and gentleness, and kindness, and those characteristics of Jesus that I find myself breaking into in about every second video, they bring life to the world. So even though even though you might not be surrounded by a million supporters who are angry at the same things you are, you end up creating around yourself a community of people who want to build a better world. This, this is the best path. This is the best path. No more, there's no need. There's no need to, to manufacture outrage in your neighbors. Give them, build in them, nourish in them the capacity to love more deeply. Amen.